Good morning, my name is Murray Palmer and we're doing a riveting program this morning and we're following up on an earlier PowerPoint presentation. What we're talking about now is the whole preparation for our rivets. This is vital to every single hole that we're going to deal with. When we drill a hole, our drill bit cuts through that material. And in cutting through the material, it creates a stress riser. That st the stress risers um, need to be removed. So if we've got so if we've got a hole, we're looking straight down on top of the hole, and then we'll just turn us to this to the side, and here's our hole here. Half a hole, how's that? Okay? Now, what we end up having to do is that if you put that underneath the microscope, there's a whole bunch of jagged edges. To us it looks you know, especially as I get older, I can't see as good as I used to. But if you put it under a microscope, it's really jagged. So we need to get that smooth. So what we're going to do is we're going to take off about 2.5 thousandths of an inch off of the both sides of this hole, this side and this side as well. And I've got tools, and I've showed you in the last, the, the previous video, not the last one, the, the, the one the other day. Uh, of those tools. And I'm going to give you a demonstration when we get out of the shop. You can use a large drill bit, you can use deburring tools, there's a whole mess of different things you can actually use. But we want to make sure that we get rid of that stress rush, and that's really, really important. Can you see the arm? Okay. Um, okay, holes must be slightly okay. Let's talk about that as well. When we put a rivet in here, there's our hole. When we build, we use a uh, a 1 8 inch rivet for instance and we're going to put it into this hole here if we drill a 1 8 inch hole with a fractional drill bit this shank is exactly 1 8 inch and what will happen is that when we push it down into the hole as it goes through the hole it will peel pieces of material off of the side of that rivet that now creates a problem when it comes to corrosion sets it up for corrosion. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that it doesn't corrode. So what we end up doing is we have um, a number of different drill bit sizes that we're going to use for the different sizes of rivets. So for instance, if we had 332, uh, whoops, 1 8 Five thirty seconds. Can you see that? All right. And three sixteenths. We want to have a hole in our material about two thousandths of an inch larger. Two to two and a half, maybe even three thousandths of an inch larger. Not much more than that. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to go to to drill our initial holes in our sheet metal. We're going to go with number drill bits. And the number of drill bits that are coincide with this, that is two and a half thousandths of an inch larger than 332, is a 40, a 30, a 20, or a 21, depending upon the manufacturer of the rivet. And then when we get down to 316s, it's a 10 or an 11. Okay. Each one of those is what we want to use for the finished hole size. All right. Now the next thing I want to tell you, if we're going to drill holes, every hole that we drill, no matter what, we start off with a number 40 drill bit. And the reason that we do that is if we say, for instance, we'll have a piece of sheet metal, we put a little uh, center punch mark in it, and we want to put our drill in there, and we realize that, that, hey, you know what, after I drill that hole, it's not quite exactly where I want it. We can do things like we can, what we call drag a hole. We can move it a little bit by, and, and, and now, so what we're going to do is we're going, so there's our, there's our number 40 hole going through here. So if I'm going to upsize this to, say, 532nd or 316th, and I need to move the hole this way, I can. I can just move my drill bit over, angle it slightly, get it to start, bring it straight, and run it in and out. Does that make sense, you guys? It, it's one of those tricks that you learn in the trade. It's, it, it's 
something that makes us look good when we're doing the when we're doing our, our work. Okay. Uh, Murray, what is the, the 40, 30, 20? That's not metric. What is No, that, it's, uh, it's a wire gauge setting. So when we work with, uh, we got all the different standards out there. We've got SAE standards and all those kinds of standards. Working at, at zero and working its way backwards because if you notice, we've got some funny numbers on it. This, is, this thing runs exactly backwards to what it should in my mind. Anyway, we can go up to 80, which is really, really fine. It's hard to even see. You can, you can see it up to a zero. And the zero is about point, a little bit larger than a quarter of an inch. Okay? So that's basically what that comes down to. Does that help you at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. So as I said, you want to make sure the holes are slightly oversized so that we don't damage the rivets putting in. You should be able to take the rivet with your thumb, just push it in. You shouldn't have to force it in. If you're forcing it in, then we've got problems and we've got to upsize the hole to the correct size. So we'll make sure that we don't do that when we're doing work in the future. So again, here is the, I guess I didn't have to do it all on here, did I? We've got the different sizes that we're going to deal with. There's the rivet size. This is the pilot size, okay? So this is the size of that rivet there. There is the size of the number 40. See, we're only going, like in this situation, we're less than about three and a half thou difference between those two. The 1 8 inch rivet should be 0.125 around and, and the diameter. The <coughs> drill bit that we'll use, 1.285. The thickness of a human hair is larger. It's all it comes down to. So that's their differences that you're going to deal with. When we get down into these ones down here, we're dealing now, for the larger drill bits, letter drill bits. And we have drill, letter drill bit gauges here, and if we have to get into it, we're going to need to, be, need to be that precise to drill a large hole, we will get the correct size drill bits, okay? Now, here's what I was talking about. <clears throat> if the rivet itself causes a problem, it's going to peel the finish off of there, and we don't want that to happen. So we need to have a bit of a gap in that hole. Now what ends up happening with the rivet? We drill the hole, the, hole the, the rivet itself drops into the hole. When we start to buck that rivet, the rivet gun is, is driving on the, on the rivet head, the bucking bar is actually what's doing the work. It bounces off of the end of the rivet and comes back. And in that coming back, it flattens the rivet, okay? So what ends up happening, the reason we oversize that hole a couple thousands of an inch, we drop it in because of the ease of doing it, and now what happens, the first couple of hits, that rivet expands and actually fills that hole tight. Okay, now, if there is a gap in our skin, for instance, let's say we've got a skin that looks like this, and we've got a little bit of a gap here, and our two skins, we haven't pulled it together enough, what will happen when we put the rivet in, it'll, go, it'll fill that It'll do that on us. And now, and I know that you guys already experienced this, when it comes to drilling them out, you have a difficult time getting them out. But well, what's happening is that it's riveted between the skins, and you now have to do some magic to get this thing out of here so that you don't act, actually damage the skins. And all it comes down to is making sure that if you, you have to drill into it, that you've gone straight down the center of that rivet shank, and then there's not enough material left after you remove this to, uh, to leave any strength in there and it'll collapse in on itself and come out fairly easily, okay? Um, so we talked about deburring uh, and what I want to talk about as well, deburring is not just the holes, but every piece of skin that we cut, we take over to, to the shear, we, we stomp it, it cuts the, to the correct size that we're looking at, we need to get rid of all of the stress risers that are along the skin. Even a shear, if you start to magnify that finish, you're going to see all kinds of jagged edges. We'll deburr with a file. Each corner, all the way around, all whatever corner, if there's cutouts and all that kind of stuff, we need to radius every single corner. Okay. So what we normally do with a radius corner is we're going to be looking at a piece of material perfectly square, 
that's not square, but anyway, let's, we'll, we'll say that it's perfectly square. What we need to do is we need to radius this corner here, on here, and this corner here, this corner here, and this corner here. We want to take off about between a sixteenth and a one eighth inch, and then we want to take our cloth. We just want to round out, and we want to do both sides of the skin. Now, by taking by by removing that sharp corner, we got rid of the stress rises. And as I was telling you in the first video that we, we dealt with, once that aircraft fires up, it vibrates. And it's continuously vibrating. As long as there's noise in that aircraft, it's continuously vibrating throughout the whole flight. As it climbs altitude, it expands it con and contracts as it comes down. It expands and contracts in the heat. Uh, and, and the cold ch temperature changes. This all has an, a real huge bearing on, on these skins. And that's why we have to be so careful in de-riveting and re-riveting and making new skins. When we have two skins together, we may and we have to drill a hole. There's going to be the odd time when you have no choice. You can't get in to get any kind of what they call swarf out of here. Swarf is a material that gets cut off and slides in between skins. If these two skins are held together really, really, really tightly, chances of swarf getting in between the two skins is remote. But if it's not held extremely tight, it can get swarf in there, and we have to do what we call a fit up. We'll, we'll drill all the holes, if there's material in there, we'll take it all apart, and we're going to debur each side of that skin. If we're doing a repair, sometimes you can't do that, and we just have to close our eyes and say, hey, we did the best we could, but 99.9% .9 of the time, you're... there's a deburring tool, all it is is just a little tool that sticks in there and cuts the sharpness off, of the, or cuts the sharp edges off of the, of the skin. Now, I want to talk about countersink. I haven't, we haven't talked about countersink rivets, countersunk rivets at all, I don't, in this. So far, we've only talked about the universal hedge, really. We do have what we call countersunk rivets for better aerodynamic uh, cleanliness of the aircraft sort of thing. Every one of the rivets that we would countersink, we have an, a countersinking tool that will have a 100 degree countersink on it. And I'll show you how they work. We've got them out there. And when it comes time for us to get to that point where we're going to start doing those, I'll give you a whole bunch of practice because we need to make sure that you countersink them correctly. Okay? The rivet style that we put in there is called a 426. Uh, the countersink done on the other skin must be of the correct depth. Now, the skins, if it's too thin, we will not countersink, we will dim it, and that's a different process, okay? So all we're doing is we're just shaping this, the metal so that the countersunk rivet fits in, that 426 rivet head actually fits in it, sort of thing. And we'll get into countersinking and dimpling a little bit further down the road. So there's your 100 degrees that I'm talking about there. Every one of the rivets and most of the other hardware that you're going to deal with in the aviation world has that 100 degree unless it's very special and sometimes you get 82 and sometimes you get 110 degrees but most of the time the majority of stuff the screw heads you work with the rivets um, most of the fasteners that are countersunk will all be that 100 and 100 degrees now this is something we don't want to have happen we don't want to oversize our countersunk poles we have to learn how to do a correct setting of our microstop tool so we only go down so far so that when the rivet drops into the hole, it's flush or two thousandths of an inch above. Two thousandths of an inch above is very acceptable because when we drift it into the hole and then we rivet it, it will flatten to a certain extent and should end up being perfectly smooth. We can get down to putting uh, a gauge on there that will tell us exactly how high it is. If it's one thousandths or two thousandths. Now, if we're down below, two thousandths of an inch below, we're too deep. And we're going to have to upsize the whole, we're going to have to go through a whole bunch of issues. And I don't want to get into to belaboring that, but we just have to make sure we do the correct size. If we make a mistake, we're going to have to fix it. There's a Microsoft tool that you'll use. And there's a whole bunch of different heads for different with different pilots on it for the different size holes that we're going to work with. And this is Microsoft adjustable. You can you can 
and it has an infinite number of settings on it to get the exact height that you need when you countersink into the materials. This is basically uh, the uh, dimpling process. If you notice up here, the material has been bent around the hole. And, all, and, and if you notice from the side view here, this is three layers of, of skin. Each one of them has been bent. Now, when we get into this, the first one is 100 degrees, and these other ones here, uh, in some situations, I've seen go to 110 and then to 120 degrees. In this particular situation, on this diagram, they're calling for 100 degrees. So what we're dealing with is uh, a larger dimpling tool with a larger pilot for each one of those. <clears throat> Again, the process that gets used, the, the, the other skin gets dimpled, and we can get into countersinking the thicker skins underneath because you can't, you can't dimple heavy skins. So the skins that we're going to work with from 40 thousandths of an inch and less, which most of, this, most of the skins on this airplane are that, uh, will end up, we'll be dimpling it, and I'll show you how to dimple it. We can hand dimple it, and we can, we can machine dimple it if we have to. Okay, there's a hot dimpling process. We weren't going to be using that. Uh, we just, it's, it's something that is for modern aircraft. Just to let you know that it's out there. Uh, here's the, again, just the different styles. And I think what we'll do when we get further down the road, we'll talk more about dimpling and countersinking entirely by itself. Uh, this is the type of hand squeezers that you can use to dimple. And we can also squeeze rivets with that, and I'll show you uh, how we can go about doing that in a little bit later process. Oops, sorry. <coughs> this is the process of, there's going, there's going to be what they call a, a cup doll there, a snap in there, and there's a, an, an anvil up here, flat belly. And this is under a hydraulic pressure, and it actually comes together and squeezes the rivet to the right side. We just set the jaw closing depth on it. So it's very, very powerful. They will destroy um, cell phones, I know, because I crushed my cell phone on one day. <laughs> Different styles of, of rivet guns, we're going to get into that a little bit more when we go to the shop this morning. <clears throat> There's the, the operations of it. We are looking at try, oops, trying to get the springs. We don't have the springs here. We made up the, the, the bungee cords. As long as we've got that, this will work. What we've got to do is we retain that uh, snap in the gun itself. Really important is that we get the proper snap to fit the rivet head, okay? And you want to have, so that this just doesn't touch the skin. See how close that is? The skin would go right there. There's not much room, and this has to be goes on straight. This one here is too small, and it's going to leave a ring around the top of that rivet. It's called a smiley. Different kinds of sets that we can use. I'll show you all about those. It depends on the job that we're doing at the time and how we can deal with it. Different kinds of bucking bars, and again, when we get to the shop, I'll walk through a whole bunch of that kind of stuff with you. I do have printed information that I can give you as well. That's the process, everything, and every time you use the rivet gun, same as using your drill a bit, make sure it's at 90 degrees to what you're working on. And if there's a curved surface, I'll show you how to make sure that it's, that it's straight to that. Now, we'll, we're going to get into single person, two person riveting styles when we get into putting the big skins on. Small repairs we can do by ourselves, you don't need two people, but anything larger that we do. There is a, a different, uh, uh, a different uh, set of problems that you can have with your rivets. Now, the other ones here, these are the perfect ones. These are problems, gaps, uh, wrong shaped heads, Angled heads, skins having uh, not not worked or not pinched together well enough, bubbles in the skin, dumped heads, cracked rivet heads, uh, angled uh, sets on, them, and damage where it comes off of them. All of these things, I try to teach you how to keep yourself from having the problems. Everybody's going to have them. It's going to happen to every one of you if you've never done any riveting before. But then you learn how to avoid that after you've made a couple of those mistakes. Again, a refresher for you. You've seen this before. You understand what it's all about, how to drill it out, put a sand punch hole in the center of the rivet, drill through the head, snap the head off, drift the, the tail out. 
And again, here's how the bucking bars actually work on the rivet. It, it, the, you pull the trigger, the rivet gun is held up against that rivet all the time. There's always pressure on that. Do not let the pressure off of that gun. You hold that in your one hand. The other one that holds the bucking bar, your other hand that holds the bucking bar, basically it has to move, okay? And it doesn't move much, but it does move. It bounces away, and when it comes back, it does the damage to the tail. In other words, it creates the shock head that we need to create. And that's it. All right, so what we're doing here today is, is literally building ourselves a rivet gauge so that we understand the length of the rivet that when we put it into our piece of material, how, much, how long it has to be, and after we have bucked that rivet, we're going to be able to measure the depth and the width of the head so that we can determine the shock head size. And what we're going to do is we're going to build it to the dimensions that are on this piece of paper here. That's basically a finished one right there. Absolutely. Here, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. All I'm doing is just measuring this right at the moment to make sure that I'm square. I'm using parts of the caliper and I'm measuring for length. And everything works out pretty good. It's fairly square, so I'm happy. So what you want to do is just get the edges. Yeah. All, you're, all, all, all we're, we're going to do is just get rid of the of that. Yeah. So can you yep. check? Oh yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's no, I think as long as you've done that. Oh, you got one there. Okay. okay. The file's not. The file's not your friend, but I'll get it. Yeah. Okay. Once you now. Thing. Go ahead. Um. You can file them in. File them in. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now. What you need is the numbers. So, once you've got them down here, there's your dimension 136 to 1, 1, 0.136 to 146. So, what I'm doing, I'm just going to that one. which is roughly halfway between those two numbers, right? I'm giving myself a little bit of fudge room to what I'm doing. So this measurement is going to be from there to there. You may understand where I'm going with this? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this, I'm going to say, okay, Scratch mark. Yeah, that scratch mark is one part of it, or two to zero five two. So we'll just go with this and go. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is replicate the numbers that we have on our drawing onto here so we know which uh, corner we're going to create the specific size slot. So we're going to start with three, four, five, and six. Basically three, four, five, and six. You know, okay. yeah, you don't have to be right on top of the hole, but close, fairly close and, and you should be good. Yep, good, ideal. And so, four, just as, just as we basically got on this drawing right here. So we're doing that one there. Yep, and then we'll go to 
alive. And why again are we numbering them? So you know what size of a, of a hole that you're going to be drilling, and you know what size of a rivet that you can put into it. It's just a guide, it, and it becomes one of those things. We'll talk when we get further into the kind of the riveting thing. I'll talk a lot more yeah. about the sizes and making sure that you understand them. Remember, I was, oh, perfect. Yeah. So we've got some more. Uh, we well, don't have any 330 seconds. There. That's mine. When you drill a hole, what ends up happening? We talked about this about stress risers, stress risers, right? Right. And you can actually see the stress risers on here if you get looking. Yeah. So you see them? You can see them there. Then every piece of skin that you're going to work on, you're going to do this as well. So you're going to you're going to do probably three passes at least with a file on each edge. Okay. The end like that. The edge like this. Now, you flip the other side, the edge like that. Oh, okay. But you got every single edge that you're you're working on, and you gotta kinda keep a, keep track of where you've been so that you don't under or don't miss anything sort of thing, okay? Now the reason I'm doing it on this is it's not that this is gonna become a problem because it's not gonna have a load on it, but I'm just showing you how you're gonna end up doing it. So at the end of it, you want things to be smooth so there's no so now what we want to do is we want to mark that in relation to the direction it should be on here right so this is a dimension b so dimension b is going to go up and down on this corner right yes so now what i would do i would take this knowing that this is the top corner i would put this in like so and i would score just like that okay that's how now yeah. now the next one, you go to back to a point one one three six, six. or say point one yeah four, one one four one one four. Okay. 